Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to This Week in Mormons. Appreciate you tuning in again this week. Please visit us over at uh, thisweekinmormons.com and subscribe to us wherever you get podcasts. I'm Jeff Openshaw. I'm Jared Gillens. There he is. <laughs> We're happy this week. Usually I wait for you to introduce me, and then I'm disappointed because you forget to introduce me. That's so why I'm getting So better. thank you for leaving me that space. I'm getting better. Um, our guest is not aware of this, but often we have guests on, and I do a full guest introduction and say, oh yeah, and Jared's here too. And I forget. <laughs> so... So this week, excellent interview we have for you. Very excited about this because we love talking about early church history on this show. We've had interviewed many interesting people over the years who are experts in this space. And so this week we are speaking with Adam Jortner. I'm hoping I pronounced your last name correctly, Adam. I almost, I didn't even ask you before we went on. But Adam is the Goodwin Philpott Professor of History at Auburn University. Uh, He's the author of The Gods of Prophets Town, The Battle of Tippecanoe and the Holy War for the American Frontier, and the Audible Lecture Series, Faith and the Founding Fathers. And this week we're talking about his new book, No Place for Saints, Mobs and Mormons in Jacksonian America. So we'd like to give a warm welcome to Adam Jortner and say, uh, roll tide, right? Right? (laughs) No, that is correct. Oh. That's Bama. Even I know that. That's Bama, <laughs> not Auburn. Um, what you want to say is what we want to say is War Eagle. Um. I was just trying to needle you a little bit to start huh? off, but it's good. Good to have you here, Adam. Thanks for joining us. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, that is that is part of being a uh, part of being an Auburn professor is getting stuff from 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 Tide fans. Uh, I have to. I used to work with an Auburn alum, and so we would. Just, it was just a thing. We had, if it makes you feel better, I'm completely neutral on all of that i'm sure and i'll just make to make everybody else feel better you know when i put in wrong answers for my multiple choice exam sometimes i will choose you know pick the which biblical quote did our author refer to and give three one possibilities then you write in one which is like uh david's heading to the fifth yard line david's gonna run back the uh david's gonna run back the touchdown Auburn's gonna win the football game as the (laughs) biblical quote which sometimes people do pick (laughs) <laughs> um, so I, I do appreciate that. Uh, and for all your listeners who don't watch football, you can just ignore the last 15 seconds. Oh, come on. I mean, we've got Latter-day Saint listeners. So many of them care about BYU and University of Utah. I assume I'm not among them, but that's fine. I proudly tell everyone I'm one of the few BYU alums who never went to a single football game because I'm a nerd and had, and had no friends. So very cool book, No Place Friends. I enjoyed reading this quite a bit. Um, I just love to know what's like what's your what's your background in general in academia, and what interested you in Latter Day Saint history and in this period of it uh, in general. Like what what brought you here? Well, I was my interest has has always been in uh, American religious history and mm-hmm. trying to figure out it, its texture and and one of the one of the things about American religion that I don't think we notice, uh, Americans don't notice this about our own religion is that we're broken up into all of these denominations. Um, I, I think uh, saints are aware of this. Um, but I, I think a, a lot of American Protestants just don't even notice that. And I sort of was trying to figure out this, this particular texture of, of American religion and how, how it makes us different, how it complicates our, our politics, how it complicates our social life. And I got really into, I, I started studying early American religion, and I just got really into miracles and monsters. And I started reading all of this stuff, and there's all these interesting accounts of miracles uh, going on in the early republic. Um, a, a lot that we have are, are from the LDS church, but a lot aren't. And uh, so I ended up writing a dissertation about sort of, you know, the miracles and churches and, and how miracles helped make uh, the American world of denominations. Uh, I mean, that, that was a, my book, Blood from the Sky. And, and I mean, the short version of that is, you know, basically once you say, uh, once you've got freedom of religion, one of the things that makes a church is a miracle. And before freedom of religion in, in the U.S., to speak really broadly, uh, if you have a miracle, you know, there are ways of institutional churches have to check that miracle. Uh, you know, nobody, it isn't just that anybody can have a miracle and then the Catholics will recognize it and the Presbyterians will recognize it. But once you're in the United States and freedom of religion, once that First Amendment is law, if you've got a miracle and your church rejects your miracle, you can go make your own church. And this is where sort of, in, in my opinion, this is kind of where uh, uh, sort of the, the top just comes off. And there are all of these interesting churches which claimed divine miracles, or they talked to an angel, or they spoke with the dead, or they cast out a devil. 
and most of these churches don't make it. Um, and, and of course, you and I both know that uh, there is one church that made those claims and survived and indeed thrived into the 21st century, and that's the, the LDS church. Um, so I originally was sort of looking around for sort of miracles and, and what people thought about them and how people argued about them. Uh, and I wrote a book uh, in which the, the, the LDS played a small role, but um, uh, essentially I had so much, there was so much more that the LDS had, had collected. Um, you know, the, there's a group called the Osgoodites. There's not a whole lot about them. They're, they're not around anymore. There was a, a group called the Free Will, the, the Babcockists, uh, who ran a Free Will Baptist church where they talked to an angel. They're not around anymore. But the saints kept a lot of their evidence and, and a lot of their early accounts. They survived. And so I had a bunch of stuff on the, on the saints, and I just I had a, a book's worth of stuff about them. And I just, I said to myself, if I don't write this book right now, I'm going to forget all of this amazing stuff that I've learned. And I wanted to just, I wanted more space to tell the stories um, that I had found out and to sort of think about, to think about the early Mormons as a church in a world of fracturing churches and in a world of, uh, of sort of violence, uh, uh, because the Jacksonian period is one of our most violent periods in, in history, and sort of how does that work? And this is the book that, and so, so I wrote this book. Yeah. <laughs> this book, and then this book happened. Can, can you tell us about that? The, uh, I just want to say, so the Jacksonian period being violent, that's something I think we say offhandedly. It's a major theme in the book that kind of drives everything. Can you tell us more about like, why do we say the Jacksonian period of America was more violent? What tell us about that? Inform us. About that. Sure. Uh, in the Jacksonian period, uh, one way of putting it is ideas are strong and institutions are weak. Um, you have uh, essentially policing powers, military powers, the the strength of the state to be able to police and enforce its own laws is pretty weak. The ability of groups to enforce their will through violence is very, very high. Um, so of course we have, we have, you know, really famous incidents of violence and you know, Indian removal and enslavement are at the top of that list. Uh, that you just have a world where violence against uh, uh, Native Americans against enslaved people is just par for the course. But there are also a number of cases where violence is enacted against other groups because it can be. Um, and, you know, in terms of religious violence, there's uh, the Charlestown Convent uh, riot in 1834, Mormons expelled from Jackson County, 1833. The, the Shakers, for those of you who know about the Shaker Church, there's a number of mobs that go up and attack them, and the Shakers are pacifists. Um, and practitioners of sort of non-Western religions, uh, Indian uh, religions, Native American religions, uh, also face sort of violence as well. And there's also sort of small episodes of violence, um, uh, you know, where someone, uh, uh, you know, Mormons sort of face this kind of, you know, Depending on the day, someone might come and yell at a Mormon preacher or throw ink at a Mormon preacher or throw a stink bomb uh, into it and sort of minor, uh, uh, you know, not minor, but but sort of things that don't escalate to the point of, of deadly violence, um, you know, enacted against members of the church. And I was, a lot of these things happen simply because there isn't the, the idea of an authority that's going to keep people in line hasn't really been developed, or to, to put it a different way, particularly on the frontier, there's a certain sense that if one can get away with it, then it is legal. Uh, there's a sense that whatever you want to do can be done as long as you have enough friends to get away with it, which is to say the concept of law isn't as strong as the concept of popular majorities. Um, uh, uh, people, particularly if you can claim we are the majority, therefore we can do whatever we want to everyone else, 
that's a lot more powerful than the idea that no, every person in this country has rights. Um, and you know, this is what gets Indians kicked off their land, even when they haven't legally ceded that land. Plenty of people lose their lands uh, simply because white settlers show up and they say, "No, this is ours." And the people try to make the case, "Oh, well, we didn't. We ceded this land, not this part. Forget about it." And this is what happens to the Mormons. And I, I, as I began to tell the story, I realized this was a big piece of what I wanted to talk about, which is. How the heck does anti-Mormonism go from, you know, being, you know, hilarious jokes about the Book of Mormon in 1830 to killing people in 1833? That's it's not a big gap. Uh, so I'm trying to figure that out, too. Hmm. So, so is that distinctive? Because you, you, you mentioned you just listed off a few like outstanding examples of. Uh, anti-religious violence um, that were not necessarily Mormon. Mormonism was one of them with the Jackson County expulsion. But what what is it that makes I mean, is, is the what like you said the the escalation in three years is that what makes this case study distinctive? Is it how intense it got? Like what why is it that Mormons are a standout case among Catholics and Jews and Shakers and whoever else? Mormons are a standout case because it happens so so quickly. Uh, right, because there's no LDS church in in 1829, and then four years later, not only is there a church, there's you know several efforts uh, uh, to expel them from, from from various towns and and areas. So what I I think the Jackson County example, and and I, I think his, Jackson County is actually understudied in Mormon history because it's not as it's not as dramatic and it's not as deadly as uh, the expulsion from far west or from Nauvoo or uh, there, there are, uh, you know, the story doesn't improve after Jackson County. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we need to take that again because my earpiece fell out. Sorry. No, you're good. All right. I'll go back and say it again. What was I saying? Something. Um, Everything got worse after Jackson oh, County. Oh, yeah. So, um, I mean, things, things don't improve after Jackson County. But why Jackson County is really important is it's, it's a good case study uh, with uh, anti-Semitic feelings. Anti-Semitism is very, very old. Uh, Anti-Catholic feelings in Protestant majority countries, very, very old. But anti-Mormonism, it, it doesn't exist. And then suddenly it does. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a good way to sort of really think through what, what creates hatred in some way? What creates anti-religious hatred? And, and what's the difference between having a legitimate criticism of a religion, which I totally think we can do, versus having a prejudice against a religion so much so that there is violence against them, uh, which I think we want to avoid. Uh, and, and, and Mormonism gives us this kind of perfect example of how did it happen? Yeah. So I want to try something, and uh, sure. And, and so I, w I want to take your 150 page book that you you know spent a lot of time and effort crafting, and I want to sum I want to summarize it, kind of what the argument is for so the answer to that question as I understood it, and then and then please correct me or elaborate on where I skimp too much, right? It, love it, love was the fifth element all along. That's the, <laughs> that's the I Sorry, thought it was ahead. Lilu or whatever. Anyway. Um, so, so, so the, so, so first of all, we have a church and we have like, you know, like, and, and you point out there's all sorts, there's all diversity of prophets and people doing magical things at this point, uh, using seer stones, divining rods, et cetera, et cetera. This isn't new, but then you get Joseph Smith and somehow his ideas catch on. And then there's, so he, he starts teaching, he starts building a, a, a body of doctrine and some of the things people don't like. And on top of what things people don't like, always accompanied with that is then rumor, right? So you say, well, here's what Mormons believe. And then as that gets passed down the chain, rumors start up and you start getting people passing around things about the Mormons that aren't even, aren't even relevant to what they believe or just sort of like almost tangential. So you add, we don't like their beliefs, plus all these rumors, Fuhrer starts to come up. And then, and you mentioned this, that uh, when you were talking about the Jacksonian era and the violence associated with it, that law and the idea of citizenship particularly are a little slippery and ill-defined in this era of the American experiment. 
And so you start to getting people in Missouri, uh, you point out particularly, starting to view themselves as we are legitimate citizens because we represent the culture, the beliefs, the practices, whatever, of what a citizen looks like. And these guys, the Mormons, they are different from us because of all the rumors we believe, et cetera. Therefore, they're not citizens. And so then once you start othering people, and especially in the, you know in America where we have this, here's this constitution, we have this new bill of rights, but it doesn't apply to you because you're not a citizen. And so once you can other a group and, and, and mark them off in whatever way, but in this case as non-citizens, suddenly no holds are barred anymore. You can, everything goes out the door, civility, law, discussion, um, you know, all those things. And so it's now like, Hey, now we can be violent. Now we can do whatever we want. And Mormons at the same time are, are fighting back and saying, no, we are citizens and we do have rights. No, we, I mean, it doesn't matter what we believe the, the, the bill of rights guarantees a freedom of worship and that we can do whatever, you know, we want on this, on this front, but it's not a convincing argument when one group has written you off as non-citizens. And that's how we get from zero to we're kicking you out or killing you in three years. So tell me what, what I left out. Tell me what I explained wrong and uh, enlighten our, our, our listeners. No, you did, you did a good job. Um, uh, but you, you, everyone should still read the book because there's lots of good like, <laughs> jokes in it. Um, uh, you're exactly right that there are... Uh, there are so many reasons why violence can happen, and I think this, this particular case um, has a lot of similarities to our own era. Uh, because anyone who's been a member of a minority religion, I think, has experienced and has experienced some kind of discrimination. You know, we, I, I don't know if this is y'all's experience, but you, you, you feel like, oh, you rack your brains, what did I do what is it that I believe or that I practice that has so offended them? And the thing we often forget is oftentimes discrimination isn't because of what people actually do or actually believe. It's what somebody else says you do or believe. Um, you know, and I, uh, I, I, uh, I raised Jewish and, of course, uh, uh, someone... Uh, I ran into someone, you know, when I was growing up who thought we still practiced animal sacrifices in the synagogue. And she was very upset about this. Uh, and of course, that, you know, this is a misunderstanding. Rumor is something that drives, um, it drives misunderstanding, it drives fear, and it drives hate. Uh, we know this, and rumor is is particularly pernicious. Uh, rumor is a hard thing to understand, but um, uh, one great way somebody else defined it this way is: rumor isn't rumor doesn't care whether it's true or not. It's not that rumor is false; it's something that might be true. And usually, when someone passes along a rumor, they're trying to be helpful. Oh, I heard this. Does this help you? But when the rumor isn't true, that doesn't help at all. It just it fans the fire. And uh, in many ways, rumors often meet our worst expectations better than reality does. Because, of course, a rumor is designed to sort of catch you and pull you in. And rumors spread like wildfire on the frontier, just as they do today. Obviously, you know, uh, every, everybody be real careful before you share on social media. Please, please, please. It's really important. Um, same thing is true in uh, early Mormonism. Uh, uh, of course, it's not spread through electronics, but it is spread through newspapers. Uh, newspapers who uh, very often simply cut something out from another newspaper and paste it into their newspaper. Or who, uh, and this was very common in the 1830s, newspapers will say, it is said that, and then they'll report whatever it is somebody heard, and that kind of goes out uh, into the world. Uh, so what you get is rumors about Mormons doing things that Mormons don't do, uh, uh, circulating. And most people uh, in the U.S. will have met an anti-Mormon rumor before they meet an actual saint. Um, and so this is, we have to sort of remember that a lot of what uh, is driving anti-Mormonism isn't the actual practices of the Latter-day Saints, um, but it's sort of Latter-day Saint practices sort of seen through uh, a, a, a sideshow mirror. 
uh, that have been sort of warped. You know, the, 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 the one thing that the saints are always complaining about is the idea that the 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 church uh, is paying for Joseph Smith is paying Joseph Smith this huge amount of money. He, they bought him a house, and the church is constantly having to tell people that that's not the case. We're not we're not doing that. Um, but the rumors go on anyway. Um, so I think that's the, the, sort of trying to get my head around the rumor, and it was it was very satisfying sometimes I would see a rumor written down in a letter to someone and then later I would find it in print and then still later I would find it in a Latter-day Saint publication saying hey everybody this rumor is going around it's not true uh there's a rumor about the saints are hiding uh, rifles in coffins so everyone be careful because the saints are just a front for the British and the rifles are in the coffins. And uh, the W.W. W. Phelps has to write a letter, you know, in the evening and morning star being like, uh, that, that coffins gun thing, that's not, that's not happening. Um, so that's part of it. And then you also hit, I think, the other element, which is this question about citizenship. And, you know, of course, a citizen is part of the nation, right? Especially part of a republic. You're, you're part of the uh, citizen comes from the Latin kiwis, right? Right. The, the 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 city, a member. So citizens have certain rights. So the way people get around that is to define certain groups as being outside of citizenship, and they don't do this. They sometimes they'll do this legally, um, but more often they just do it rhetorically and then hope it has a legal or political effect. Uh, they sort of define Mormons as being not really American citizens. And, you know, I, I think your listeners probably know this. There's zip in American law that says that Mormons are not citizens in, in 1833, or at least that white Mormons are not citizens. Um, uh, uh, they're born in America, and they have citizenship, and there's, there are no religious qualifications for, for being an American citizen. None. But in Jackson County and in other places, too, you know, they believe in angels. They believe in miracles. They listen to a modern-day prophet. And these aren't qualities that you can trust in a citizen because a citizen is supposed to be neutral. A citizen is supposed to be Christian, by which they mean Protestant. Uh, and, and much the same way of uh, anti-Catholic sentiment. They are following a Roman dictator. Uh, you can't be in a church that has a single head because that's dangerous, it's not democratic, and therefore anyone who believes that is outside the realm of citizenship. Anyone who believes that is outside the realm of citizenship, and when you're outside the realm of citizenship, the law doesn't protect you. Or it, to put it, at the very least, there's a different set of laws. Um, how can we have non-citizens settling here in Jackson County? And that's where uh, th those two things put together are a, a pretty deadly mixture. So one thing I'm curious about is this, this argument in general, which I, I agree with it, but I think there's a lot of other Latter-day Saint research that would suggest a lot of the hostility towards the saints was because there were so many of them, they started to form a solid voting block. You see a lot of this in a lot of research about um, members of the church in our history. But do you feel like the primary driver towards hostility for them was about the fact, was about more of the mystical side of it, the spiritual side of it, the fact that we have angels and visions? And that was this off putting element to uh, the other folks of Jackson County. Uh, it might have, and it might just be a mix of all of them. But do you really think that's the, the main driving force beyond politics or? block voting, things like that? I think, I, 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 I think, hmm, I'll put it this way. I think being Mormon didn't matter until it did. And that is the case, that is often the case uh, uh, in cases of religious violence uh, and, and sort of a religious distrust is it, it's everything's fine and then suddenly everything's not fine. But to sort of answer that, there is concern that the Mormons are going to form a voting block, but the Mormons haven't formed a voting block, so far as I can tell. 
Right. That doesn't um, really become an issue until Nauvoo, Nauvoo right? right? Like in yeah. Nauvoo, that that like that is a thing that you know that Joseph promises votes to one candidate and then they vote the other way. Uh, oh but yeah, in, you had. But in the Missouri era, this isn't this isn't happening yet, right? Yeah, it it is. Or, or to put it a different way, the anti Mormons are saying they will they will form a block, and we should act to get rid of them. And again, pay really close attention to this because one thing we should avoid doing, and I get a little preachy about this, but one thing we have to avoid doing is we can't take the anti-Mormons at face value um, because, again, uh, uh, there, there, there's an old, I mean, it's, there was a, a big, I mean, American history has not always been fair to the Latter-day Saints. Shocker. Uh, spo- spoiler alert. American history has not always been fair to the saints, and it has there there has been a tendency, and this is a really old tendency to say, well, because the Mormons are odd or different, then they probably deserve what was coming to them. So you know, maybe these anti-Mormons were 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 just carefully delineating their concerns. Um, but of course, pay close attention; they're going to form a voting block. Not that the that the older settlers who had been there before, not that they were forming an anti-Mormon block to get rid of the saints. No, no, no. Right. It's the saints who are going to form a block. And there isn't really... I didn't find any strong evidence that the Mormons actually were acting that way. They're certainly, uh, uh, you know, they're certainly different and distinct uh, from the other people in independence, or the other whites in independence. But I have a hard time, I, again, the other thing to remember about the, the anti-Mormons is they sort of threw everything. If you read their manifesto, that they, they, they issue a manifesto just before they march in to independence to sack the Mormon uh, part of the city. And literally everything's in there. Oh, they're going to upset democracy. They're going to uh, uh, ally with uh, enslaved people. They intend to force us out of our homes, so we're going to act first. Uh, it is essentially the same argument that Pharaoh uses to enslave the Israelites in, in the book of Exodus, right? They may rise up against us. But at a, at a deeper level, too, um, we also have to remember the people who rioted against the Mormons hadn't been living in Independence or Jackson County all that long. Uh, Jackson County is only open to it, 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 it's Osage territory. It's only open to white settlement in the 1820s. So this is not people who have lived in the area for generations. These are people who came six years earlier, and now the Mormons are showing up, and now there's that sense of of resentment. Um, I, I think the key point is they're trying to justify a riot, which means that what they're what they're, they're not actively giving us real political um, concerns as we would understand them in in a, a, a functioning democracy. If there's a functioning democracy and you think someone's forming a voting block illegally, you go to the courts or you try to raise public opinion where you try to get political powers, uh, legal powers behind you to stop an illegal activity. What they are trying to do is gin up enthusiasm for violence to gin up anger and they say all kinds of things but i think the one constant that they always keep referring to is these guys believe in angels these guys believe in direct revelation these guys believe in casting out demons and that's not safe you can't trust these people with the ballot box so we have to kick them out we have to essentially cleanse this county of them or else you know, the, if if you don't do it now, they will destroy us later. When and again, up to 1833, you know there are of course Mormons who say something like, "Yes, one day this will be you know the seat of God's own empire and and a, a godly country." There are Mormons who say that, but that's a um, I have a hard time sort of thinking that that was a, a legitimate political concern that happened to result in violence. I think it was something that anti-Mormons who were afraid of these guys draft into their, their rhetoric. Yeah. So it, I was going to say, it kind of reminds me of a modern day version of that. When, uh, when they were building the temple in Newport beach in, in my native orange County, California, 
there was a time when the design was presented to the city and they had concerns like they do in some, like the high lighting, things like that. You know, some of the modern day, I don't know if it's anti-Mormonism, but some of the excuses and they say, you can't build this, even though like the other mega church up the road did the exact same thing and nobody cared. Right. But, um, but the church once I made the initial plans, because the temple as built is not what was originally submitted. It's smaller. It's a little bit, well, it's shorter really. And it works just fine. But the church's reps actually presented to the city and said, this is like what God wants it to be. And then that didn't fly. And so just when you were saying that, it kind of, it just made me think of what, if they were saying that back in Jackson County and you could see back then it engendered a lot of violent hostility, but even in our modern era, even if it is God's will, but if you explain that to a civic audience, they might just be like, what? Like you're, you're just trying to build a building that I'm not going to go into. I don't care about. So a little bit of a, I said, I'd have digressions for you before we yeah. started Adam. No, I mean, and we, we, we do have, uh, it's it, that that's exactly, I mean, I think you're exactly right. Um, I, I think the modern, to me, one of the modern parallels was, uh, the hubbub over the so-called ground zero mosque. Uh, where Muslims in the city of New York wanted to build a community center on 15th Street, uh, uh, which is you know uh, more than a mile away from from Ground Zero. Local people didn't want that to be built, and lo and behold, they start calling it the Mosque at Ground Zero, implying that the city of New York wanted to build uh, an Islamic worship center right where the worst terrorists. Uh, uh, attack in American history had been, and of course, everyone uh, that that got everyone ginned up, and it got everyone angry. Um, and, and again, the goal was to prevent the mosque being built uh, uh, farther uptown. Um, and uh, that's it's that kind of attitude of well, we're going to make sure that this particular group, this particular group, has to pass a higher level of criticism and investigation than if you're going to build, you know, a Catholic church or, or a Presbyterian uh, meeting house or, or whatever. Um, they're citizens, but we're, it's okay for us. It's okay to sort of rake them over the coals. Um, right. And there's no shortage of rumors and, you know, hearsay and things that we like to pass along about Muslims and, you know, groups like that, especially in the wake of, 9-11 and those terrorist attacks. But, you know, I, that's, that's one of the things I thought about is I was reading the book, you know, you're talking about the rumor mill about Mormons and how, how you know, you can make, you know, you look at these aspects of the things we believe about them and that, therefore we can argue they wouldn't make good citizens. And I'm like hearing echoes of people complaining about Sharia law and things like that. About, Here's the reasons why we can't trust Muslims to be good Americans and therefore it's okay for us to you know, curtail their rights, you know, or not prevent them the exact same civil liberties that I enjoy because they're a different group that doesn't share my American Republican values. Right. And, you know, uh, um, a slightly different version. I heard it in, in, in 2012 when Mitt Romney was, was running for president. Right. Um, the, the best moment, probably the best moment in the 2012 election was when someone tried to explain to me that Mitt Romney wasn't uh, trustworthy because he was born Mormon. But Harry Reid, who was the Democrat, he was okay because he had converted to Mormonism. Make the tracks, yeah. yeah now, honestly, I don't really remember the logic there because I think I was going like, how can I get out of this conversation? I mean, I, I think I made some effort to sort of be like, well, I don't think that's true. And here's why. But uh, mostly I was at that point, I was like, think, think I'm done here. Um but that's, you know, that is, it, it is precise. I mean, I think things are, 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 are better now than they were in the, in the 1830s. But that is how rumor works. It's, um, it dresses itself up like it's factual, but it's not. And it, it, it sort of wants to push you in, in an extreme uh, direction. And I, I, I deliberately say rumor does that. Because rumor is, isn't, you know, there are people who, there are rumor mongers, you know, there are, uh, there are bots out there that uh, spread disinformation. There are actors who spread disinformation and misinformation, but rumor also sort of, uh, the reason that works is that rumor can take on a life of its own and it can, you don't, you don't know what direction it's going to go in. Are yeah. rumors like, do you feel like they're, I don't want to say uniquely American, but when you look at what happened 
in what we study in this book, and even in our modern era, like we're talking about today, it almost seems like we haven't learned anything. And we can, and we find new ways to be susceptible to the same stuff. And I think it's easy to say like, well, you could pick apart all the million reasons why, like, are we not educated enough? Are we not discerning enough? Any number of things. But um, like, do you feel like we have gotten any better from the 1830s until now and actually being a little bit bad? I mean, you talked earlier, you know, be very careful on social media. I just, I find it fascinating how many parallels there are to 200 years ago and today, and you would think we would have evolved more as a society. And I wonder if that's an American thing or if that's just a a humanity thing, which it very well might be. Well, I'll say this about Americans. We love our freedoms and rightly, rightly so. We love our freedoms and it's very hard for us to accept the idea that freedoms come with with a cost that there is a certain we we have a very we like to talk about personal responsibility but we're not so into personal responsibility because i don't know if we're supposed to be free so why would we be restricting ourselves but Hmm. you know i i think part of the thing about being free is that it comes with all of these responsibilities and americans don't always want to do that one thing uh that crisscrossed the country in the early 19th century is drinking and drinking to excess. And I promise I'm going to tie this back. I swear. Mm. But well, we're Latter-day Saints. We know a lot about that. Yeah. About that. Well, you're, yeah, right. I mean, people are cover. drunk, you know, I mean, college professors are drunk teaching class. Uh, I, that always gets a good laugh when I talk about it in class. But, and part of the reason, as the great historian uh, W.J. Rohrbaugh said, is, you know, drinking and drinking to excess is a way to show that nobody's in charge of you. So to be drunk was to be free. Um, and that attitude is, is part of our heritage, too. Um, so that I, I think people don't want to, uh, the rumors, because they're part of free speech, are something we might be particularly susceptible to and you know all the more reason why we need uh you know good voices to tell us to sort of how to how to be responsible and and to remind us about being responsible and the fact that you know just go ahead and i'll i'll say this because i'll preach it you know before you pass on that piece of information just go ahead and, and verify it maybe maybe just check whether the link you know uh has uh is connected to worthy news sources or whether it's, you know, the Arizona times picayune dot pizza, something like that. <laughs> right. um, because we do want us, we, we do think information should be free. And, and, and I, I, I agree. I, I love that fact about, it's one of the things I love about being an American. Getting us to be responsible is uh, a chore. Um, but it, it, it's, it's one we, you know, it's one we should, should undertake. Um, I don't know if that was a great answer or not, but uh, I think it is. And, and actually, this, this whole through, and then I felt like I was running out of steam. Yeah. No, 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 no. I think that was really good. And in fact, like this whole the question and the answer reminded me a lot of last year on the show. Um, Jeff and I interviewed Keith Erickson, who's the head of the Church History Library, and he had written, just come out with a book called Real versus Rumor, and it was all like the whole premise of this book was that like here's how you can take these rumors and these fabulous stories and these like pseudo historical things that get passed around, you know, and, you know, Sunday school, elders, corn blue society, but also on the internet and, you know, just word of mouth. And and he's specifically aiming at Mormons, right. About current Latter-day members of the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day saints. Um, But, you know, and I mean, but his book was like sort of a microcosm of what we're talking about right now. And that, you know, no matter if it's before the information age, when people are, just passing things word of mouth and, and you know, a, a newspaper is just cutting and pasting from another newspaper without checking their sources, whether it's then or whether it's now when you can just click and forward a meme or whatever, or, you know, here's something that somebody said offhand in Sunday school and then pass it on in the next ward that you visit. Like we, we continue to do this. And I remember, you know, Jeff, you know, cause part of your question was like, shouldn't we be better at this? And I, I asked a very similar question to Keith Erickson. And I said, you know, I said, you know, again, we're talking about, you know, a book that's specifically aimed at Latter-day Saints. And I said, hey, we're supposed to be good at discerning truth from error, right? Like that's a promise made to Latter-day Saints and that we're supposed to have the Holy Ghost and have all this mm-hmm. ability to discern mm-hmm. truth from things that are not true. 
And then his answer I loved, and I think about this often, and he says, yeah, the key word there is we're supposed to be good at it, but often we're not. And it, and, and he talked a lot about what you just said, that a lot of times to be good at discerning between truth and error or you know understanding what's real and what's rumor, et cetera, you have to put in some work. You have to take responsibility and say, I'm going to check that URL. I'm going to look at the about page on the website and to find out whether or not it's actually like, you know, a lot of times you just click about and it's like, this page is a hoax. You know, they tell you, <laughs> but if you don't, but if you don't click on it, if you don't do the, the the hard work of like moving the mouse up and clicking on that about button, you don't, you don't find that out. And so I don't know. Yeah. I think like, you know, again, so I'm just, I guess all that is to say, I agree with you. We bear a responsibility, but we also, also, begrudge that responsibility often like well, no we're in the information age i shouldn't have to check if the source is good yeah i mean and i You've always work for me you know i always yeah. want my work as a historian i wanted to i wanted to do something um w- uh, i wanted to sort of have you know have a, a lesson to to sort of apply to our, our own time uh, but i also i like to do it without just you know basically saying people 200 years ago were us in funny suits that's not true, <laughs> they, true. Their, their history does no. matter uh, right. If I if if I wanted to just talk at you about information literacy, I would. But I mean, I think the story that thinking about the saints in in 1833 and thinking about us now and and uh, about rumor and and what it can do, you know, I also think it's helpful to say it is difficult and to remind ourselves that that it is it actually is challenging. Uh, in the information age, to distinguish truth from fiction, and Erickson's completely right. We are, we're supposed to be good at it, but it's not simple. It's hard. It was hard then. It is hard now um, because we want. There are certain things that we want to be true, and you know the rumor preys on that, uh, and and the ministers of misinformation and disinformation, uh, um, actual bad actors prey on that as well and and you know they just because you're right wing or left wing uh they they design it for both of us um everybody's equally uh uh, can be equally a victim and there were people like that in in the 1830s as well there are certain uh, ministers in particular in jackson county who we can actually detail are going around spreading anti-mormon rumors on purpose so if we don't want to be something that always works for me and to encourage me, me to try harder is, is to sort of, do I want to be like that person? Um, do I want to be someone who is carrying water for, for discrimination? I don't want to be that person. So that can help encourage me to, to be more attentive. Um, and, and again, you know, to, to talk about our, a modern parallel. That's hard to do, but you don't have to have a perfect record. Just anything you do to be careful about this stuff is is really helpful um, and uh, can be part of the solution. So I have another question, and maybe I mean I, it's maybe tangentially relevant because we are kind of talking about parallels and you know applying the his, history to ourselves. Um, so obviously this has changed. I mean, okay, obviously religious violence has not ceased to be a thing, right? We still do it. We still see it. It, it turns up in the news. You, you, you know, every, every couple of months, somebody has shot up a mosque or a synagogue or, or a church or whatever. Uh, but it's not as prevalent, right? I mean, and so you talked a little bit about what made the Jacksonian era distinctive um, as far as an era of violence. But I'm just curious, like, why, why aren't we seeing similar things? Like what changes in America? Like, is it, 14th amendment now makes it much more clear about who's a citizen and who's not. What, what is it that uh, progresses us beyond the era of, I don't like your religion, therefore I'm going to form a mob and and throw you out of town. I think we are in an interesting period. And this is, this is the moment on the podcast where, uh, you know, we're talking about serious things and someone says, well, it's an interesting period. And someone's, (laughs) You know, starts to seize up. Oh no! What are they going to talk about? Um, they're going to talk about scary stuff. You know, we have just lived through, um, you know, twenty twenty and and twenty twenty one. There was an awful lot of violence out there uh, in American democracy, um, and I, I don't want to make a direct parallel to the eighteen thirties because there was there was there was more trouble back then, but. Uh, one of the things we see is that part of what causes 
rioting is when emotions are raised to a fever pitch and political solutions don't appear to be available. Um, either because they, they, you know, because they don't exist or because they keep not churning out any sort of reasonable compromise or any sort of victories. So when those two things go together, then there is, then there's, this is when we sort of get politically minded or religiously minded violence. Um, and I mean, I, I think that part of our challenge in, in a modern democracy, um, is finding workable solutions um, wherever we possibly can. Again, uh, I, I don't want to sound like an old fuddy-duddy, um, uh, but there comes... I mean, the, the end of anti-Mormon violence really doesn't happen until Utah becomes a state. And then there's this remarkable period from, from 1892 to the 1970s where... Uh, uh, Mormonism becomes stereotyped from being anti-American to being stereotypically American. It's supposed to be we, the quintessentially, American. right? Yeah, yeah. We worked very American. It was, that was a very hard and deliberate effort. Yes, I know. <laughs> right? Uh, it didn't just happen. Um, oh, yeah. You know. Uh, uh, hey, what what's more American than 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 fleeing Jerusalem to to get to the Rocky Mountains? That's very American. Um, it's a little. Little book of Mormon <laughs> joke for, for there it is. Uh, anyway, um, what was I saying? Something interesting. Oh, right. Um, when idea, when sort of feelings are raised to a fever pitch, and there aren't political solutions available, and one more thing, and violence is touted as an acceptable response, then religious violence does happen. And you know, fortunately, in the United States. That kind of religious violence is often happens on a small scale, uh, which is to say uh, individuals begin to feel that way and then commit acts of violence. Now, that is very, very tragic, but widespread religious violence we really haven't faced in the uh, 21st century here um, among American citizens. But sort of thinking about rioting more generally and, and sort of the rise of, of political violence Part of the solution to that is uh, to have a moment where um, we keeping emotions in check and reasonable and, and appropriate to the moment, finding ways to forge compromises, and assessing whether or not violence is a legitimate answer. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I have to say, um, you know, we, we, we have a lot of we have a lot of the first two. Um, I, I do think that uh, Vladimir Putin's invasion of democratic Ukraine has opened a lot of eyes as to whether or not violence can be legitimate as an answer. Um, and again, I don't want to be a pundit, but at least in the last few weeks since the invasion of Ukraine, which is a, a terrible tragedy, and I'm sorry to drag it in here, but I get the feeling that a lot of people who had been sort of uh, playing footsie with the idea of political violence have dropped that and have pulled back because we see where this leads. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be jumping up and down as a cheerleader here, but let's take it after have we've, we've, we made it through 2020 and 2021. Let's take a victory where we, where we can get one. If there's a silver lining, uh, to the, the tragedy that's unfolding in Ukraine, it's that Americans are realizing, oh yeah, when you go to violence to solve a problem, that is not a good answer. Um, and uh, uh, ultimately, when you back your threats, when you back your political threats with the threat of violence, you're not playing, you're not playing our game. Uh, by which I mean you're not playing sort of the American game. Uh, and uh, I think we've had a, 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 an, an important visceral reminder um that in the end violence really isn't the answer and uh, again I'm, I'm a fairly patriotic guy so this is the patriotic part of the show you know that is something that i think americans aspire to uh is that we stand up for democracy and against violent means to achieve political objectives we don't always succeed in standing up for it but i think we want to that's that our, was that's one of the best angel. Yeah, 
That was one of the really interesting things. And this was, it was really early. Hang on. I, I made a note about this. Oh, so this, this is from the introdu- introduction even. And it was, and it was so interesting. It caught my eye. And it, you, it, the quote, it, it was, uh, they met peacefully and voted on, um, I, I mistyped the quote. Never mind. But you're basically talking about these Missourians before they go out and enact mob violence, they get together and they have like this orderly civil meeting where they vote on what type, you know, how they're going to, and how and when they're going to do the violence. And I was like, it's an, and I made a note in the margin is like, it's an orderly democratic process resolving to enact unlawful violence on fellow citizens who of course they don't recognize the citizens, but still it's like, how do you, how do you, it, it feels like such an oxymoron that you would meet in a civil, you know, fashion and have like, you know, I don't know if they had like the little rule, you know, the uh, rules of order book or whatever. But, you know, you imagine like, I move that we attack the Mormons at midnight and re- pull their leader into the street and pour tar on him. I second the motion, you know, like, it, I mean, I'm, and that, I guess I'm going and moving into parody at this point, but still it's just what, how, how does such a weird dichotomy exist that like we have an orderly democratic process in order to go out and act undemocratically and violently. Yeah, here, that's how I started the book. I said, a group of American citizens met in orderly fashion on July 20th, 1833, and decided to attack their neighbors. Right? They <laughs> right. have this meeting where they put together this, this manifesto, and they, they actually vote on you know, this group of 400, 500. They, they vote to do it. So what's important there is that they have already decided that violence is acceptable. That was where the, that's where the riot starts. It starts when they say, if they don't agree to what we, de- we're going to make a demand. If they don't meet it, we'll, we'll smash up their, their, their part of the town. We'll throw them out. That's when the riot occurs. And I think something I discovered in the course of my research is this wasn't spontaneous. This wasn't like the Gentiles, all the Gentiles of independence got together and were like, I guess we'll have a meeting. This is the third time there's a core group of anti-Mormons who you know, tries again and again to try to get together a group uh, to agree to attack the LDS. And what's interesting is there's not a whole lot of evidence about those first two meetings, but we know that somebody stood up during them and said, this is ridiculous. What are you guys talking about? They, they were able to sort of talk down uh, uh, the, the violence. And then this third time, third time was, was the charm. Um, the third time they get away with it. And it, it, it's that decision to say, uh, again, it has to do with, okay, what are we meeting here to do? We're meeting here to decide how we're going to sack uh, our fellow, the, the, the saints across the road from us. It's not a decision as to whether, it was a decision as to how and when. And I think that's, uh, again, I sort of want to sort of point out how important it is that they had sort of already made that decision. And also that this isn't a sort of a, a spontaneous uprising of every Gentile in the county. There are a lot of the Gentiles in the county, but it's not all of them. And, you know, there's this interesting sense after the violence occurs, after the expulsion has taken place, there are some Gentiles who are like, this is not good. We shouldn't probably do this. But on the other hand, that faction that kicked out the Mormons is now in charge in Jackson County. So to put the Mormons back, we would have to expel them. And again, so you're sort of caught in this, in, in, in this loop. Uh, and of course, because the Mormons are sort of a, a, a despised religious minority because they're seen as weird or bizarre, it's much easier to let them suffer than to let other Protestants, Christians suffer uh, in, instead. Um, but but I, I think it's very, to me, it was very telling because there is, I, I think there is some idea, given the, the politics of the last several years, um, something I've witnessed is some people saying, well, you know, uh, if other people are losing their rights, and I, I had that concern, maybe not everybody did, I had that concern that some people's rights were, were sort of on, on the chopping block. Uh, some people would say to me, well, you know, Adam, your, your rights are, are pretty sacred. You know, you're, I'm, I'm a pretty affluent guy. I'm, you know, Caucasian. Uh, so your rights are not on the chopping block. 
And I'm not sure that that is true because what the Mormon example shows us is you're not necessarily safe because if someone dis- the, the day may come in just three years where someone decides you've done something, you are something, and it's no longer okay for you to be a citizen. That kind of sort of calculus is one of the things that makes, you know, adherence to rights, adherence to rule of law, uh, and sort of uh, uh, an abhorrence of political violence really critical uh, uh, to, to the fun- proper functioning of, of a democracy. Um, because in the end, it's never, uh, it's never just one group. Uh, and I, I think a lot of folks sort of know that. But being reminded that, you know, even the overwhelmingly white Mormon church uh, can get kicked out for uh, the belief that people can talk to angels, which is uh, pretty common these days. You know, in, in our own 21st century, many people believe that. And yet here it was used as a reason to kick people out of their homes and shoot at them and, and round them up uh, is sort of unbelievable. It, 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 it's, it's shocking enough that I wanted to remind everybody. Uh, I wanted to remind myself. Yeah. The, the curious thing in all of this is, of course, the Saints, both in Jackson County and then, you know, Caldwell County, Nauvoo, continuously sought redress from government officials or intervention. But it rarely went anywhere in their favor, whether it was state government, local government, state government, uh, or the federal government, even whether it was Jackson or President Van Buren later on. Um, but specifically in, in what we're talking about here, Jacksonian America, why were those in power not able or willing to step in and change the situation for the saints and 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 tr- and they be the ones to treat them as citizens? That's a tough question to answer. I mean, there's one very simple answer, which is, you know, the saints were on the outside and, and no one felt particularly needful to lift a finger for them. That's sort of a, a cynical way to look at it. Hmm. Um, again, something interesting that I, that I found is that there's, you know, the, the leadership of the LDS church is really trying very hard to, to try to do everything they can um, to, to reassure people uh, that everything is going to be okay and we're, we're, we really, sh- justice demands we get this back and don't worry, I'm sure we will get this back and then they, they don't get it back. Um, I think part of what happens is that every time, the, the, the few times that the saints are actually to get, able to get into a courtroom in Missouri, uh, and they're they're never able to get into a courtroom in Jackson County, which is again part of the issue, right? The law says it took place in Jackson County. Your trial has to be in Jackson County. Well, the anti Mormons have been sure to have very solid control on all the judgeships in that county. So the Mormons say well, we can't get justice there. We can't even bring. They're worried about bringing witnesses into Jackson County because they've been threatened with violence. Uh, so again, there's that threat of violence that prevents the trial from taking place there. When they do get trials in other counties, uh, again, the anti-Mormon faction sends people to those trials to shout them down, uh, uh, to to make a scene, uh, to claim that these people are, should not be in courtrooms. Um, and uh, then, of course, um, there's, a, there's a terrible accident where some, several of the anti-Mormons are in a ferry and the ferry sinks. Uh, and, of course, the rumor goes out, the saints did this. Uh, we have no evidence that any saint uh, uh, destroyed that ferry. The ferry worked fine all day until this very last run. But the rumor goes out, some anti-Mormons got killed. So what does rumor say? Of course it was the saints that did it. And sort of once that happens, show's over. Um, uh, essentially the, the, the door is, is closed. Uh, and that happens very close on when um, uh, the, sort of, the sort of March, the March of Zion's camp, uh, where uh, Joseph Smith brings down 100 Mormons, with the idea of, okay, we're going to provide some kind of armed escort for our people, um, that you know, sort of dissolves in, in uh, uh, an outbreak of cholera. And the saints 
retreat, uh, essentially. Some stay in Missouri uh, they, and try to figure things out. A lot of them go back to, to Kirtland, and sort of Kirtland is, is the main center for the next couple of years. Um, I, I don't want to say that the Saints sort of gave up on, on uh, redress. They don't. They, they continue to petition for it. But I think by 1834, a year after it's happened, uh, I think most of the saints, and particularly the leadership of the church, was aware that this isn't going to come to anything. We're going to have to getting. We're not going to be able to get redress from this unless it comes from the the federal government. And, and one thing you noted is um, that even redress from the federal government could have been a thornier thing in pre or an antebellum America because the Fourteenth Amendment wasn't in effect yet. And that was a kind of a quick aside, a quick little note in the book. But that was something I rarely think about when I, th- when I read about church history in the sense, you know, I think, well, very clearly petition the federal government, they can swoop in, but it's a good reminder that the power of the federal government was a very different thing before the civil war. And, um, and my understanding of course, is that under the presidency of Andrew Jackson, he viewed it more as a state's issue and was all, and even on top, aside from the 14th amendment was just less inclined to intervene and viewed it as this is a Missouri problem. Missouri needs to sort it out. And then on top of that, there was the whole concept of, um, I'm probably not explaining it exactly as I should, but basically how the 14th Amendment also, or the lack of a 14th Amendment, weakened the federal government's position in some ways of guaranteeing the rights of the saints. Would that be an appropriate way to say it? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so to, to just to remind everyone, the 14th Amendment says that all citizens uh, in America have the same access to the, the rights, essentially. It makes the Bill of Rights applicable not just to the federal government, but to the states as well. The 14th yeah. Amendment does a lot of other things. It's a really cool amendment. Um <laughs> But you know, prior to the 14th Amendment, 1867, um, the right to freedom of religion cannot be abridged by Congress, but states can feel free to, to set up whatever they want. Um, so, you know, yeah. for example, that's how Massachusetts actually has a state church until, until 1834. Um, and it's the Congregationalist Church, if you're interested. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, and, and so the... the the saints have a federal right to practice their religion, but Missouri is not bound to recognize that right. And sort of Jackson, of course, uh, we could say he thought it was a state's rights issue, but for Jack, I mean, that's another way of saying when white Americans rose up and demanded something with violence, Jackson almost never bothers to intervene. Jackson sees this as part of democracy. Uh, Jackson's not above this. He, he's, he's part of this. When people rise up to expel Indians, he's in favor of it. Uh, you know, when people rise up uh, uh, to smash the Charleston con- convent in in uh, outside Boston, uh, he's not in favor of it. But he doesn't send in troops. Uh, he doesn't doesn't do anything about it. He takes a very laid back approach because this is how democracy works. Yeah, I mean, he, he dueled a man to death at one point. He, <laughs> more, like, more than one. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and again, this is how, when we talk about violence being acceptable, um, you know, I'm not, uh, it, it, the problem isn't just the, the person of Andrew Jackson. Like, okay, Andrew Jackson, no. not one of the greatest guys in history, but also not the cause. Again, he is, he is a, um, he is a symptom rather than a cause, but that the, mm-hmm. the, the guy in the federal uh, mansion, the guy running the government, is a guy who really feels that like, hey, if people, if you offend the majority, if the majority doesn't like you, they can enact violence to get rid of you. Uh, and that, that is perfectly consistent with his ideals of democracy. And one more thing to notice about sort of protection of freedom of religion it depends on your definition of religion. And of course, the way from the very beginning, Mormons characterize their faith as Christianity, right? Again, no big surprise. And anti-Mormons characterize the faith as either foolishness or credulity or a joke or a secret dictatorship um, uh, by Joseph Smith Jr., uh, they, they'd say this religion isn't really a religion. And we see this in our own day too. How do you justify violence against a particular religion or, or, or laws that target a particular religion? You define it as you say, well, that's not a religion. It's a cover for something else. Or you say, that's not a religion. That's 
superstition. A, or it's a cult. Or, or it's a yeah. cult. Right. Yeah. Um, um, uh, you know, and, and yeah, you say it's not a religion. It's a cult. Why do I always get questions in my religious history classes? Why do people join cults? And I always try to say, for the same reason they join religions. And people are very unsatisfied with their answer. They, they really want to know that, well, if you join a small religious group, you must have some wild out there reason. Whereas if you join, you know, uh, a really big church, you're just, you're just joining the crowd, I guess. Um, but, you know, it, it, it doesn't, uh, I think we, we know it doesn't work that way. Every religious decision requires uh, uh you know it requires something um uh and i'm not sure you know, the size of the religion you join i don't think that makes a a, a real change in thinking well it's hmm. funny to think about that i mean for christians jesus was still the small out there religion in the beginning right like everything everything starts at a certain level and can grow into something else right and i think latter-day saints were no exception obviously there was a at the time of joseph smith you know in upstate new york there was the burned over district, as they say, a great sense of spirituality, lots going on. Um, and I think you kind of, you kind of feel like, do you feel like Joseph Smith was uh, like distinctive in that time, in that regard, or is he one of many people with similar views and supernatural and spiritual and all of that during that period of history? Cause it seems like a very interesting part of American history. And it's curious as Latter-day Saints, we, we zero in on it on Joseph Smith, but I also don't know if he was like the only actor of that, of that ilk during that time. I mean, it, it, it's both. And, um, which is a a super non answer, but, uh, you know, I think Joseph Smith jr. Has, is, is he's soaked in a lot of these ideas. He grows up in them and a lot of, you know, there are a fair number of other people who say similar things, who engage in similar practices. Now, when this sort of, you know, when when this eventually sort of comes to light in in the 1940s, uh, and, and then through the you know to our own day, pointing out that there are people like Joseph Smith in the early Republic in antebellum America is is sometimes used as a reason to back the claim that Joseph Smith made it all up. Uh, and and I don't want to suggest that in in any way. You know, just the fact that Smith has contemporaries actually doesn't say anything about whether or not his religion is, is true or not. And I really, I want to hammer that home um, because in one sense, no, there isn't anyone like Joseph Smith Jr. No one else makes the claim that they have dug up golden plates from the Hill Cumorah with the guidance of an angel, translated them spiritually, published that, and then recreated uh, the original Church of Christ on earth. No one actually has that exact claim. Other people make similar claims or engage in other sort of uh, um, uh, mystical activity. Other people are known to dig for treasure, uh, uh, which is an activity that has a fair amount of Christian connotations in the 1820s. Uh, other people claim that they are restored Jews. Um and, and of course, the 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 denominational problem, the problem where everybody's forming their own church, uh, not only are other people doing that, but that's part of why Smith feels compelled to become a religious seeker in, in the first place. And of course, you know, Latter-day Saints know very much how he talks about it. It's, it's the cry of lo here and lo there, and all of the churches are competing against each other. This is part of how Smith described his own spiritual journey. Um, so uh, Smith is not one of a kind, I think. Um, um, but of course, he is one of a kind. Uh, uh, you know that nobody else founds the Latter Day Saints. So I, I think his, we might say, his experiences and the religious world he lived in was not unique to Joseph Smith Jr. But of course, you know, obviously, the church that he founded is quite distinct. Uh, I mean, sort of, it's almost a, a point you want to be like, well, duh. Um, but I, I, I think the bigger point is Smith doesn't need to be a completely original thinker in all ways, shapes, and forms for his church to be uh, either theologically true or unique. Um, and, nor is it true that um, you know Smith 
is as uh, uh, I think John Butler once described Smith as being all the way out, way out there on the edge of the diving board. I don't think that's true either. Um, you know, we, we, I think that's looking at the Latter Day Saints from a modern perspective where there is so much distinct about the, the, the Mormon faith tradition and saying, well, it must have always been like that. No, it, I think early Mormonism looks a lot more like uh, other American denominations of the time, but a lot of those denominations didn't make it. Right? We, don't, we don't have Shakers anymore. We don't have Osgoodites anymore. We don't have Wilkinsonians anymore. Um, uh, we, we don't, there was a church called the Screaming Children. Uh, that didn't last super long. Uh, you know, these groups don't really... Um, make it out of the antebellum period. Uh, and the ones that do disciples of Christ do, churches of Christ do, they've become a lot more like uh, standard issue uh, Protestants. So Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists. Spiritual, Seventh-day Adventists are still around. Spiritualists, by and large, are they're not, they're, they're still around. There's not too, too many of them. Um, Unitarians and Universalists today are quite different from what they were like in the 19th century. Um, so, you know, there's, there's an extent to which the LDS is sort of still has retained a lot of those characteristics. Um, uh, and, and some people look at the LDS and they see how distinct it is and they say, well, it must have always been, uh, um, they're, they're basically the way I describe it in the book. Here's how I describe it in the book. In our modern world, we really have two choices there. There, there, of course, we have a lot of different forms of Christianity and belief in America. And that's what I study. But in the popular imagination, there's sort of evangelicalism, and then there's the mainline Protestants slash secular approaches, right? We have sort of two options. Joseph Smith Jr. has dozens and dozens of options. It's uh, the antebellum spiritual hothouse. There's a lot of people making really radically different claims from one another. Um, uh, so he says, everyone's crying low here and low there. And I, I sort of make the, one of my funny jokes is that today we just have low here, right? You say, well, there's going to be evangelical Protestant Christianity and there's everything else. But Protestantism in, in, in Smith's day has all kinds of permutations. Even Judaism is starting to get divisions uh, around the time uh, that Smith is uh, uh, sort of discovers uh, uh, the gospel. I, I think that sense of frenetic competition that creates the church, or, or we'll say gives rise to the church, is why people originally joined. Um, I think that feeling is still there in, in the modern Latter Day Saints, and that's why it can sort of appear confusing because there's been uh its competitors have sort of boiled down to just there's, there's a lot a lot fewer competitors these days it's true and even like you know you watch a movie from you know even like 50 60 years ago and you know some methodists will be talking about it and they're like oh and they it turned out that he was a presbyterian and you know and and the, and the, and the audience of 60 70 years ago is going to laugh really hard at that and i'm watching it and i'm going like is there a difference between a Methodist and a Presbyterian? And I know that comes out of my own ignorance, but also I think it's, you know, kind of illustrates what you're talking about that like, yeah, they, they have different tenets and different things that they emphasize or believe in, but by and large, they're just part of what we now call mainstream American Christianity. And so, yeah, it is, it is a bit of a different world, isn't it? Right. When in, in the Muppet movie, when Kermit and Fozzie meet electric mayhem in the church and Fozzie <laughs> says, they don't look like Presbyterians to me. That is a gut buster from the 1970s. And it <laughs> doesn't really play as well play today. today. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there has been, uh, and, and these, are, these are things that are, you know, didn't involve the LDS at all, but you know, the sort of rise of mega churches, non-denominational Protestant Christianity, or evangelicalism, whatever you want to call it, uh, has made a sort of a, a subculture that, that sort of transcends Presbyterianism, Methodism, Baptism, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so that the differences really today are not between, in, in American Protestantism, it's not between uh, uh, Baptists, Methodists, uh, 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 you know, Seventh-day Adventists. It is between sort of um, churches that consider themselves evangelical versus churches who consume, consider themselves mainline. And Presbyterians are on both sides of that. Methodists are on both sides of that. 
even, and I can testify this, living in Alabama, even Baptists uh, uh, are, are on both sides of that. Um, and we, so we look at that living in the 21st century, and there's a tendency to say, well, it must have always been this struggle of evangelicalism versus secularism, uh, which it was not. Uh, and, and also, that's not a, not a super nice way to treat the main lines to be like, well, you guys are really have a secular outlook. No, it's, it's just a different way of experiencing Christianity. Um, but we read that struggle of uh, fervent heart religion versus the main lines back into our past when that's really not just a 20th century development, it's really a, a late 20th century development. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, not that that makes it untrue, but it's just that that was not the main divide in American Christianity uh, uh, really until about 30, 40 years ago. Interesting. All right. Well, I've got, as we wind down here, what do you hope Latter-day Saints today in 2022, what do you hope they will get out of reading your book, No Place for Saints, that they might not know already or think about already? Well, uh, that's a good... Oh, now, now is where I have to not sound like I'm a, I'm a jerk and like I'm going to tell the saints what to think. Mm -hmm. I, so just tell us what to think. We love okay. it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we love it. Um, Sometimes we want the revelation to be done for us. So, you know, if you can just. <laughs> I think, uh, no, if I, if there's something I wanted, um, I, I wrote the book both for, for saints and for, for Gentiles. Sure, um, sure. And certainly for Gentiles, I wanted to introduce them to, you know, write a sort of a uh, short introduction to sort of the, in, the origins of Mormonism. And then also to sort of think about religion, violence, discrimination and citizenship in a way that uh, uh, doesn't that, that that's we're going to sort of talk about it in very different contexts from from 21st century for saints I want I think my goal was to talk to them about the origins of the church in a way that um, I hope sort of puts the world of the early saints in conversation with the world of early America in a way that sort of tells the story of the saints from the, I think a lot of histories of the saints are written with the knowledge that the saints are going to get to Utah and they're going to establish Deseret and they're going to fight with the government and eventually they're going to become a state and everything's going to work out okay. The saints at the beginning, didn't know that was going to happen. I wanted to write a sort of a, a history of the early saints with the danger back in it, with the mystery back in it, with the fact that one of the absolute most common things for a saint between 1830 and 1835 is somebody who was a saint today is not going to be a saint tomorrow. Saints, people come in, they go out. Sometimes they come in, they go out, they come back in. They have arguments with Joseph Smith about... Are, are you really the prophet of God? Or I think I've got my own revelation, which I also found with the seer stone. And page. that yep. this sort of, um, uh, so I think what I kind of want the saints to get out of this is that, the, you know, the church doesn't emerge full grown in 1830. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's, uh, I think saints know that you know, the doctrine and covenants are barely begun. Uh, they're putting together the church. God is revealing to them how the church is to be put together over time. And no one knows how it's going to look. And when the violence comes, they don't have the safety of knowing everything's going to be okay. And yet many of them choose to sort of, to sort of fight on. I wanted to write, and I hope I have, what I was trying to write is, is I wanted to write a history of how the saints believed themselves, um, and and how they how they became kind of a faith community, which is why most I, I spent a lot of time talking about Joseph Smith here, but um, there, he's not he's in the book. You can't write about the LDS founding without him. But I tried as much as possible to to write with sources from folks who were not Smith to sort of see Mormonism at the believer's eye view, and and to sort of think about all the different voices that came together in this church and how they had to negotiate with one another and figure out what they were um, and then how they had to face 
the fact that people hated them for that. Um, it, it's not a tidy community that necessarily loved each other uh, when push came to shove. It was a tidy community that had arguments with each other. And when push came to shove, they still had arguments with each other. And, and you know, what was uh, wh- why it's such an honor to, to be able to write about the history of the Saints is that, uh, you know, their, their story is really remarkable. They're remarkable people. And they they followed their hearts. Even the people who eventually leave the church, they were not afraid to make bold decisions. Uh, and I, I kind of wanted to write about what that was like. I think that was more typical for America than we think it was. And I, I, I wanted to get at that experience. Um, so I hope they learned that. And I, you know, I hope they learned something about um, how rumor and how discrimination um, has worked in the history of the church and, and take that as, as a cautionary tale uh, uh, that this is uh, protecting citizenship and protecting religious freedom is, is something we can all get behind. Um, um, because, uh, uh, again, sometimes being different doesn't matter until it does. Well said. <clears throat> Well, Adam Jordan, thank you very much for joining us this week on This Week in Mormons. I've enjoyed very much discussing your book, No Place for Saints. We'll have a link to it on the website at thisweekinmormons.com. Everybody, you can pick it up. Highly recommend you do. It's a good read. And as Jared said earlier, 150 pages, thorough, but not overwhelming. You know, and, you're not you're not committing to rough stone rolling here, people. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> and like Adam said, there's also jokes. Like there's a lot of good like things that made me stop and I like, wait, what? And I'd reread it and I'd like have a good chuckle out of it. You mean like there's, treasure there's... like treasures disappearing magically on their own? And, oh yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, I don't even want to get into it because I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to spoil all the good things. Like there's there gotta go. be people gotta have something to look forward to. There so, yeah, go. there's there's cool stuff in there about how how treasure works and uh uh it's it's more... and how to find it. Yeah, and how to find it. And it's uh <laughs> it's more religious than you think. <laughs> really good well love the book everyone please go and pick this up and of course if you haven't subscribed to the show already please take the time to do that leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and join us on social media and i haven't done a patreon plug so support us on patreon patreon.com slash this week in mormons help keep the lights on that's how we bring you this program largely without commercials or other intrusions uh once again adam thank you so much for your time it was really nice of you to sit with us and uh talk to us tonight thanks jeff thanks jared i I enjoyed it glad you did jared thanks for being here too buddy Oh, yeah. Thank you both. I really enjoyed this. Until the next time, everyone, this has been This Week in Mormons. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.